I am Professor Farah Kareem Cooper, and I have been a Torch Fellow at uh, Oxford University for the last year. Um, I work at Shakespeare's Globe, where I'm Director of Education, and I'm also Professor of Shakespeare Studies at King's College London. Uh, and over the last year, I have spent time uh, working on this Torch Fellowship with Professor Nandini Das, uh, who helped me to come up with um, a plan for the year. Um, having been based in a cultural organization for the last 18 years of my career, um, as well as being a, 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 a practicing academic, um, we thought it was it would be a really lovely opportunity to expose the students here and the community here at Oxford University to ways of thinking about and theorizing about performance practice in the early modern period, and also how that intersects with questions about identity and migration and race, which are things that Nandini Das and I both work on. The Torch Fellowship has uh, helped me considerably to create um, collaborations uh, between Oxford uh, and Shakespeare's Globe. Uh, as part of the fellowship over the last year, um, I've come over and given a couple of lectures uh, and brought practitioners from Shakespeare's Globe who have worked with the students on thinking through performance questions, um, but in their bodies. And so they've, they've run uh, workshops on Globe performance practice, uh, as well as on um, uh, gesture and how the body moves in performance and how uh, in the early modern period, as well as in the contemporary period, how it's theorized when you think about the body. What's been really exciting about uh, the workshops uh, and the collaboration between Shakespeare's Globe and Torch is that the students have been exposed to ways of thinking about performance uh, that incorporates their body. Equally, the Globe has a higher education program, and we've been working with students from all across the country. Uh, we work with a lot of American universities as well, but we've, we've never really worked with uh, Oxford University students. And so that was a really great opportunity to expand um, uh, the, the community that Shakespeare's Globe is working with. In the final lecture, of um, this Torch Fellowship. Um, I'll be speaking to members of the public as well as academics and to students and people from Shakespeare's Globe. Uh, and uh, I'll be talking about the relationship between uh, theater history and race and focusing really on the question of evidence. What do we have evidence for in the archives? And how do we know what we're looking for? Theater history is built on quite precarious evidence um, we don't really know exactly what the Globe Theatre looked like, but we built it anyway. Uh, and so it's about having um, confidence in that evidence. But when questions about racial formation or the presence of uh, the global majority in Shakespeare's London um, is brought into question, loads of evidence is presented, but somehow it seems less plausible. So my question uh, for the lecture this evening is to think about why is that? Um, and how can we incorporate or desegregate theater history and uh, critical race studies? I'm really grateful uh, to Professor Nandini Das for um, inviting me to, to come and take part in this fellowship uh, at all. It's been a fantastic collaboration, and she and I have managed to find lots of intersections in our work and bring com um, the performance community together with the literary community. I'm very grateful to the Humanities Cultural Program for enabling this fellowship to take place. Uh, it's been a huge opportunity for me to be part of this community here at Oxford, and I look forward to future collaboration. Uh, hello all and welcome. Uh, my name is Wes Williams. I'm a professor of French uh, early modern literature and also the director of Torch, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities. And I'm very proud to be able to welcome you all on behalf of the Humanities Cultural Programme, a part of TORCH and also one of the founding stones of the new Stephen A. Schwartzman Centre for the Humanities, due to open in a couple of years' time, um, <laughs> and where we hope we shall have events such as this and indeed plays of the kind that we'll be hearing about uh, today, amongst other things. Also part of the Humanities Cultural Programme already, we have a, uh, a series of visiting fellows, 
And for almost a year now, Professor Farah Karim Cooper has been with us here in Oxford as a visiting fellow. We are delighted to have had the privilege of supporting Farah's work over the course of this fellowship, and of course, to co-host with Exeter College this lecture and book launch this evening. Without further delay then, I shall hand over to my excellent and altogether wondrous Oxford colleague and Farah sponsor for the visiting professorship, um, visiting fellowship here, Professor Nandini Das, Professor of Early Modern Literature and Culture at this very college, um, uh, who will introduce the project in more detail. Over to you, Nandini. Hello, everyone, and welcome. There was a point some time ago now when Farah and I, as one does, started talking about possibilities around our collective interests in early modern theater. Um, and as it happens quite often, again, that caffeine-fueled conversation sparked an idea. Um, and from that came many more conversations. And in the process of that, one of the things, most wonderful things happened, which is seeing Farah's work de develop and grow into the book that we are celebrating to some extent today, but also her wider scholarship and her wider contribution to the field of Shakespeare studies, early modern studies, and race studies, essentially, within the UK and beyond. Farah is Director of Education at Shakespeare's Globe and has been there a moving and shaping force there for a long time now. Um, she's also Professor of Shakespeare Studies at King's College London. But over the last year, we have been extremely lucky to have had multiple occasions to tempt her to Oxford, to talk to our students and have collective discussions both at the Globe Theatre and in Oxford about the ways in which we can engage with and interrogate early modern theatrical performance and texts um, in perhaps different and often unanticipated ways from our traditional scholarship. And that's been hugely productive for everyone involved, I think. I'm really delighted that today we can not only hear Farah talking about her research, um, but also celebrate this book. And I'm at this is the point where I wave around my copy of it um, as a mode of celebration um, to celebrate the Great White Bard, which I think is going to be a really significant moment in Shakespeare studies um, and in our collective, collective conversations about the intersection between our present and the past that we engage with. But I know talking too much about how wonderful Farah is, is a very, very inept kind of um, replacement for, from actually hearing from Farah. So will you join me in welcoming Farah to talk about Shakespeare? <laughs> Wow. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I just want to say a huge, huge heartfelt thanks to Torch uh, for hosting me over the last year and to Exeter. It's been such a privilege to be visiting fellow here. And I've really enjoyed working with the students. And I know that our GLOBE practitioners have loved coming here and working with them as well. So thank you so much for opening the community uh, to the GLOBE so, so beautifully. Um, I'm also, I just want to say a huge thank you to Holly and also to Emma for organizing uh, all of these events. It's been, it's taken such a huge amount of effort to do it and uh, I'm really grateful. Um, towards the end of 2019, after curating uh, a series of Shakespeare and race events at the Globe, I was seriously considering writing a book on Shakespeare and race, one that would be read more widely than anything I'd written before. Focusing on a general readership would allow me to address so many of the questions sent to me after the first Shakespeare and Race Festival in 2018. Namely, what does Shakespeare have to do with race? I had a lot of butterflies in my stomach about it, nervous to write a book I felt other people were better placed to write, nervous to write a book that was not speaking only to my peers, nervous to write a book that we might be dismissed out of hand by many, 
who would take the evidence of pre-modern racial formation that I would present as not evidence of anything at all and reject it as misinterpretation, generalization, deliberate anachronism. I was also nervous to write a book about the country's beloved writer, knowing that women of color tend not to be considered eligible for the status of public intellectual when it comes to Shakespeare. If you consider the way that certain right-wing outlets have received the anti-racist Shakespeare webinars my department curates, for example, you might wonder what possessed me, really, to write a book called The Great White Part. When on GB News, this is the expert take on such work, and I know maybe why listen to them, but people do, so. <laughs> Academics who've immersed themselves in postmodern thought are often incapable of grappling with literature in anything other than a superficial way. Even, if, even the people who run the Globe Theater, who you would have thought might have some regard for artistry, have been running seminars to decolonize his plays, which they now see as upholding whiteness. This, of course, is activism masquerading as criticism. Clearly, my credentials are not enough to give weight to decolonial work because it does something some people are afraid of. White scholars might get less hassle, perhaps, unless they were talking about gender identity and trans or queer Shakespeare. It depends upon the content, of course. After Emma Smith's decolonial article in The Guardian last weekend about the folio's embroiled legacy in the slave trade, she'll let me know if I'm wrong. Now combine the work of reading Shakespeare through the lens of race and suggesting alternative ways to think about his legacy with a woman of color and the culture war might take over, deepened by fear. James Baldwin had a lot of thoughts about such things when he said that the white identity constructed in America and Europe and England is revealed to be a series of myths about one's heroic ancestors, as he puts it. Then that provokes fear, which produces mechanisms for silencing, as we are clearly seeing in over 17 Republican states in America. If Britain and America were to really dig in their past to uncover the racial histories there, those of us who believe the outcome of this would be education, enlightenment, and social progress are not naive to the horrors that other people might fear. Again, James Baldwin, when talking about the systemic linguistic dehumanization of black people in America and his own discovery that he will not be oppressed by these myths, exclaims, because I am not what I've been told I am, then it means that you're not what you thought you were either. And that is the crisis. Certainly, the content of my book would resonate with a critical legacy of sound and rigorous scholarship that already exists and tells the story of race in the early modern world, but that had been largely ignored to the extent that when I was writing my PhD dissertation in 1997 and wanted to explore racial categories of blackness and whiteness, I was actively discouraged from doing so and told that previous scholarship was too steeped in anachronism, so they were not just ignored then, they were dismissed. My book comes out tomorrow. It tells a story a lot of people aren't ready for. It gathers up the research of scholars of color and the critical legacy that was pushed to the margins. It speaks to the moment quite viscerally, so there'll maybe be some trouble. <laughs> I'm hoping not. Um, but I can no longer be gaslit uh, by those who try to argue that what I see isn't really there and that I don't have the skill to interpret and narrate it. An important theme of my talk today will be evidence. It will ask us to think about how we as scholars, literary or historical, choose what histories we locate and share. Paradoxically, now is the time, but it is more difficult now, more than ever in some ways, to trawl the archives without our biases and see the interweaving and multiracial history in our midst. I want to look then at, briefly at another discipline that's really crucial to my work, theater history to ask what role has race played in the field, in the field of Shakespeare studies more broadly, as well as in public perceptions of Shakespeare. The reconstructed globe, now 26 years old, was built with care, diligence, and under a set of strict parameters set out by the founding vision of Jewish immigrant and McCarthy Red Scare exile, Sam Wanamaker. For him, the globe needed to be as close as possible to the 1599 globe that Shakespeare worked for. 
Therefore, it must sit as close to Bankside and the original site as possible. It must be built entirely of timber. It must have a thatch roof and its method of construction should reflect the Elizabethan joinery and carpentry. The founding director of research and one of Sam Wanamaker's academic consultants, Andrew Gurr, nevertheless held the globe up to scrutiny, recognizing the fragmentary nature of the evidence and concluding that the final reconstruction was fundamentally the result of a best guess. Andy said this to me a lot in my early years as the resident scholar at the globe. He taught me to believe deeply in the skeptical distance scholars must maintain in their relationship to such projects, which are usually led by visionaries and artists. Another theater historian, William Ingram, offered a useful perspective on the fragmentary nature of historical evidence when it comes to London's theater industry in this period. The lack of evidence is not in itself evidence of anything other than its absence. <laughs> The fact is that there are no facts, only data, as Ingram also said. What we build from that data says more about us than perhaps about the past, something that we need to remember whenever we talk about the past and the ways in which historiography is shaped by subjective notions of truth. Theater history is an invaluable subfield of Shakespeare studies. I have benefited from it directly. It is considered utterly legitimate because of its insistence upon documentary evidence. It goes some way to fill the yearning, gaping need to know more about Shakespeare by examining his working life and the origins of his plays, since his biographical history is more elusive. As the scholar Paul Menzer puts it in his hilarious and delightful new biography of Shakespeare, of all the turning, uh, and returning points in Shakespeare's life, his departure from Stratford is the most significant. In many respects, this is the moment that matters the most. Shakespeare leaves Stratford for London, where his future waits for him. And yet maddeningly or marvelously, this is the period of Shakespeare's life about which we know the least. In other words, we don't really know how he got involved in the theater. As Menzer asks, do we say he fell in with a group of strolling players or that he fled the dullness of provincial Stratford? I'm so sorry, people from, friends from Stratford. Uh, I didn't say it, Paul said it. Uh, or he left determined to make his fortune in London. Was he Dick Whittington or Tom Joad, Sal Paradise or Bilbo Baggins? Because Shakespeare wasn't leaving for good. His was a journey of there and back again and again and again. So theater history appeals because the elusive traces of Shakespeare the man are to be found there. It is also the history of mass entertainment in England with the nation's native genius, as he's christened much later, chief amongst his entertainers. Theater historiography began the process for me of desanctifying Shakespeare, which is a necessary step in the decolonizing. As a subdiscipline, theater history is not burdened by bardolatry, although it can be used to fuel it, maybe in projects to reconstruct Shakespeare's theater. Uh, but mostly, Shakespeare's enormity is seen to get in the way. His colossal shadow can darken the corners of the archive where details of other writers, players, plays, and playhouses lay hidden, and where the questions lurk that we may not even think to ask until we ask Shakespeare to get out of the way. By focusing on the repertories of the companies, for example, the work of scholars like Lucy Monroe and Rosalind Knutson effectively decenters Shakespeare and undermines the post 19th century insistence upon singular authorial agency. It shines a light on the other theater companies, the multiple considerations for commissioning and putting on plays and putting them on in different theaters, highlighting the collaborative dynamism of the industry that made Shakespeare. By examining the fragmented and scrappy nature of playtexts like Tiffany Stern has, the myth of Shakespeare's holy canon pops like a soapy bubble. And we see how plays were developed, transmitted, cut, spliced, and patched together, as, we, as well as we see the gamut of other shaping influences uh, on the plot, the language, and the staging. The evidence used to build theater history is fragmented, also a bit elusive though there's more there than there is in biography. The fragmented nature of theatrical reconstruction, though, is a given, 
an accepted consequence of the material losses of time. And this fragmentation also usefully fuels a healthy skepticism in the field. Nonetheless, theater history is seen as fundamentally plausible, and so we have built a picture in our minds of the theatrical landscape of Shakespeare's time. And we accept the many theories and facts generated by the data that does exist, even if many details are disputed amongst the academics themselves. Entire theaters have been built on the basis of this faith in historical reconstruction, despite not having all of the evidence needed to build these theaters accurately. Um, you'll be unsurprised to hear that equally fragmented is the long history of race and race making, dating back to the pre-modern period. Also fragmentary is the evidence that speaks to the until recently hidden history of black presence and migration in this country. These literary and historic and literary scholars and historians have been brave and committed enough to locate, gather, and examine the evidence pointing to early modern England as a more racially diverse, immigrant-populated, fluid society than we have A, previously imagined, B, ever been allowed to fully incorporate into the sweep of our narrative history. You knew I was gonna quote you at some point. <laughs> Nandini Das and the work of the Tide Project, for example, highlight not only the presence and definitional urgency of strangers in early modern England, but also to the points of tension, debate, and change around issues of identity, race, and belonging that germinated as England was becoming more aware of its identity as an island nation. Elizabeth I's England was truly grappling with the rate at which its global aspirations were enabling and facilitating the incorporation of strangers into its borders, its institutions, and its cultural practices. Imtiaz Habib noted in 2008 the consistent denial of multiracial England that goes back to England's practices of documenting itself. The movement towards nationism in late Tudor England is marked by the growth of a black population whose numbers are not part of the nation kingdom's conscious body, whose facts of existence are not the subject of deliberate historical record, and whose historical presence is an ontology of absence but must eventually be formally inscribed. We don't know everything there is to know, but what we do know is enough to start searching for and telling a different story. <clears throat> Kim F. Hall and Peter Erickson have spoken of the necessity to desegregate the archives, which means to start looking for histories that are not exclusively white and to stop presuming that there are no other histories to uncover. Race conscious archival work must also understand the archive itself as produced out of colonial and racialized assumptions about which lives are deemed worth documenting. Because of this larger uh, assumption, when we narrow in on the history of theater in Shakespeare's time, we see a separation. We see that race has, for the most part, sat outside of this inquiry. Have we taken whiteness as red and approached the reconstruction of the Elizabethan theater industry with a set of assumptions in mind? such as race is anachronistic, white people were the only spectators, makers, and suppliers. Any engagement with race in a performance or dramatic text that you might find is fantastical, or it's accidental, or it's incidental. A long list of, of scholars such as Eldred Jones, Anthony Gerard Bartholomew, Margot Hendricks, Joyce Green McDonald, Ian Smith, Kim Hall, and loads of others had been locating and disseminating evidence for a very long time that shows how race is a legitimate space of inquiry. As Hall says herself, initial opposition to early modern race studies associated primarily with new historicism was encapsulated in the single word anachronism and informally deployed as a scare tactic and a conversation stopper. We're reminded by Miles Greer, while there had been praiseworthy studies of race and drama of the English re Renaissance and Restoration, Hall's study, Things of Darkness, charted a multi-genre and multidisciplinary course, where her predecessors were primarily interested in plays in which non-white characters appear. <coughs> Hall was after something else, more of uh, a, an engagement with um, the dark light binary as it structures English culture altogether. 
When Hall's book was published, it received reviews that ignored the evidence. Uh, evidence that she absolutely does bring to bear upon her argument time and again, and is effectively policed into the margins of the field. It should make us pause for a moment to think how an entire Elizabethan theater was reconstructed on far less evidence than is presented in books and studies by scholars of color that show amply how race and race making permeated early modern culture and institutions. So what is the objection to the study of race in these contexts? Is it because most of the scholars practicing are black or from a minority ethnic background? It's a really tough question to ask. It may be likely, as the racial theorist Paul Gilroy has stated, African people and their specific takes on British history are never legitimized because it is assumed they have no place in a proper understanding of British culture and national identity. Or is it because whiteness was not seen as a racial category either? Is it also because of things like institutional racism and a broken pipeline which prevents further scholarship in this area to thrive? I want to suggest here that in desegregating the archives, to use Kim Hall's term, we think about theater history too. Because it's personal to me, from my position within an organization with two approximate recreations of early modern theaters, uh, that deployed the arsenal of theater history to validate and legitimate its own academic program. And also because I'm a scholar of color who writes about race. So I'd like to share an anecdote of an exchange I witnessed that really angered me, but I'm gonna sip some water first. When I shared this incident with uh, older scholars of color, they just nodded and laughed knowingly. The exchange I witnessed illustrates precisely the ways in which theater history is seen to be bracketed from these other kinds of inquiries. So the theater history seminar is a recurring session that takes place each year at the Shakespeare Association of America conference, itself an annual gathering of up to a thousand Shakespeareans, depending on what city it's in. <laughs> the seminar consists of roughly the same members, many of whom have been part of it since its inception over 40 years ago. Um, at the 2023 conference, I audited this seminar. During the course of which, the paper of a postgraduate student was discussed. He had attempted an interdisciplinary approach examining language, theatrical documents, and pre-modern critical race studies through which he conducted a reading of The Tempest. I thought, ooh, I can't wait till that's published. But to my sadness, his paper was dismissed. The student was put in his place. I thought, ah, maybe it wasn't that well executed. But when I heard the next comment, I realized what the problem was. He was told the Tempest was not about race. In quite hostile terms. There's no evidence that Caliban is black, said the older retired scholar. Consequently, this poor graduate student was instructed not to impose modern readings onto the place. My internal sirens went off. Oh dear, the anachronism argument that in 2015, Kim Hall and Peter Erickson had declared should be laid to rest, but it had reared its ugly zombie head. The thoughts in my head sped up to a million beats. I thought, oh no, being alert to race as a context rather than a topic might have illuminated the vast complex of language that is used to dehumanize and racialize those cast as other, including black Africans, indigenous people, Indians, Jews, and Muslims in countless texts of the period, whether it is dramatic and poetic, religious, trade, travel narrative, or stories and novellas that are imported and translated. I thought, how can you not have read 25 years worth of scholarship on post-colonialism, if anything else? Or even critical appraisals of Shakespeare's language and how it works beyond the literal most of the time. Is it because you're a historian? Right? So if so, because at the beginning of the seminar, there was a statement that we're historians, we're not literary scholars, which I thought was a really interesting um, sort of bracketing from the rest of the conference as well. If so, if that's the case, why are you giving us your hot take on The Tempest without having read the literary criticism needed before dashing the paper of a budding scholar? How can you become, or how can we become, more attuned to how race making and othering operates through language in the early modern period as well as now. When will we all see that racialized identity is not limited only to skin color, but that culture, religion, linguistic difference, kinship, lineage, 
are all racial categories. Part of the problem with uh, academic perception in this regard, as well as public perception, is the fundamental difficulties we have as a culture in defining and understanding race and what it really means. Um, this is largely because literary scholars studying Shakespeare were not trained to read sociology, to read African American studies or black studies. Uh, critical race theory or feminism. We have to seek out these other theoretical models uh, proactively if that's the kind of thinking that we want to do. Um, I always recommend doing so because that helps us in redefining the terms. It's okay to put the past and the present into conversation with each other. Uh, history won't be tainted by the touches of the present. Instead, the present can be given the power to unhinge itself progressively from the histories of racial oppression, for example. So I just want to think for a moment about what, it, what we mean by race. And I think anybody who stands up here or who does this work will give you a slightly different take on it. But roughly, I think it all kind of were in consensus. Uh, in the introduction to the Cambridge Companion to Shakespeare and Race, Ayanna Thompson tackles this question by sharing an experience of when someone told her that the concept of race did not exist in Shakespeare's time. The argument was, and still is for many, that to look at race in early modern texts is to misapply modern concepts to them. This is a trap that the theater historian fell into. While the word race existed, it did not mean then what it means today, argue those who see anachronism as still a very legitimate um, stopping point. Fortunately, a current PhD student of mine is working on material that directly disputes this idea, building on Margot Hendricks's point that Italian linguist John Florio offers an entry for the Italian form of race or raza as a kind of race, brood, a blood, a stock, a name, a pedigree, uh, that tells us race referred historically to lineage, breeding, common ancestry, and that this could apply to humans as well as animals. It was not until the 18th and 19th centuries when European anthropologists classified human difference according to various factors, which included skull shape, uh, skin color, and phenotype. This biology of race uh, embedded the term and the concept into the cultural imagination in a different way throughout Western Europe and the United States as fact. This was used in order to justify the, the slave trade, American enslavement, and later Jim Crow, and then uh, continuously the legal, economic, educational, and health inequities that continue uh, to be felt today. But modern science has obviously proven the obvious that race is not biological. There is nothing genetic within us that creates our race. Race is a myth. It isn't real, so there is no race. The idea of race making is real, however, and th this is defined as the creation of race as a social entity. There you go. Uh, a category we use to assign difference and value and to structure society accordingly. As Geraldine Heng, author of The Invention of Race in the European Middle Ages observes, race is a structural relationship for the articulation and management of human difference rather than of sub substantive content. So this creation of race as a paradigm for ordering difference began uh, as racial theorists and historians note in the pre-modern era not in the 18th century. This is contextual knowledge that should help shape our approach to Shakespeare's texts as we write about, teach, and perform them. The observation that the theater historian made to the graduate student in that seminar was technically correct. There is no direct reference to Caliban being called black-skinned. But this statement, which amounts to, amounts to academic policing in some ways, was rooted in a lack of awareness about how race operates through language. It is, as the scholar Ian Smith would say, a racial blind spot. Smith's critique of how the Academy has read Shakespeare in his world traditionally is summarized in his coinage, Racial Blind Spots. Based on a physiological condition, its metaphorical function helps us to think about how we often don't see what's in front of us because of habituation. Humans do not typically notice these because the brain compensates by filling in those areas with learned information garnered from routine and habit. It's a structural blindness that in cultural terms is caused by a systemic whiteness that is undiscerning of blackness, creating a crisis in knowledge. And this is what he refers to as racial illiteracy. 
As I said, literal blackness does not need to be in the frame for one to encounter anti-blackness. And imp implied blackness occurs regularly in early modern texts through its wide-ranging metaphoric substitutes. So we have to examine the language and ask ourselves if we are still convinced, for example, in The Tempest, Caliban is indisputably not black, or if there's plausibility in the possibility. Either way, his status in the play as base and of the earth chimes with what the author Isabel Wilkerson says in Cast. It describes, uh, what she describes is at the root of racism, a deep-seated belief in the fundamental inferiority and reduced humanity of a group based on their difference, skin color being one basis only. Caliban's enactment of slave labor and the dehumanizing language and tropes that separate him sharply from the elite Europeans uh, is useful to note. Dehumanizing tactics were already standard fare in Renaissance Europe when it came to justifying enslavement, trafficking, and the slave labor of black Africans, as well as in the dissociations made of the Irish Roma travelers and the Jews from whiteness. Whichever way you read the words, it's indisputable that Caliban is dissociated with European forms of whiteness, which suggest he is racialized, and it is therefore a legitimate form of inquiry to ask how pre-modern critical race studies intersects with Shakespeare's play. I was not able to read the student's paper to see how theatrical documents themselves informed his argument, but it was clear that that was not the issue that was in dispute in the seminar. So how do we bring these two ways of investigating the past to speak to the future uh, into conversation with each other? I love this phrase, so I'm just going to keep throwing it out there. Apart from coming to grips across the early modern canon with the process of racial formation, uh, the language and imagery of race, budding theater historians can directly engage with the work of Habib and others to take black presence into account when reconstructing the theatrical past. So I have previously published on the phenomenology of gesture in performance in Shakespeare's theaters um, and in contemporary production. Uh, a couple of years ago, I brought this research into conversation with black pr present studies and with race when I published an essay in a volume on playing and playgoing uh, edited by Emma Whipday and Simon Smith. Um, so I asked the question of how emotions, gesture, audience response, and Richard Burbage, Shakespeare's star actor, and how his racial impersonation of Othello are impacted if black presence extends to the auditorium of Shakespeare's uh, theaters. It was important to ask uh, sort of wide-ranging questions, but also very targeted questions about what does racial impersonation look like beyond prosthetics of paint, textile, and costume? What is the physicality of racial performance? How many texts in the period provide racially inflected gestural cues? How do we track audience reception? And what are the implications if we deem it possible that some audience members were black and therefore witnessing a performance of blackness? In her powerful new study uh, of performance history across early modern Europe and England, Noemi Ndi argues that the scripts projected onto the material techniques used by white actors, which she identified at this time as blackface, black speak, as well as black dances in various spaces of early modern European performance culture, uh, how they shaped new habits of mind, new ways of, for spectators to think of the Afro-diasporic people who lived or could live in their midst. Theater history then has much to contribute to racial history and vice versa. If we think theater can shape values, and many of us have argued that this occurs in early modern theater, what role does racial impersonation play in the shaping of values? Emma Whipday, in the same volume on playing and playgoing I cited earlier, considers embodied performance history. In her essay, she looks at blushing and blanching on stage, but she does so without taking whiteness as a default position. She explores how blanching and blushing, quote, intersect with early modern hierarchies of gender, class, family, and race, especially as mediated by the white body of the boy actor in what she calls blush face and in blackface performances of femininity. It's a really great essay. I recommend you read it. 
But even before Black Lives Matter in 2020 pushed the field towards racial diversity even farther, in 2015, the scholars Imtiaz Habib and Duncan Salkel wrote, sorry, sorry, uh, wrote an important essay about a black family called the Reasonables who lived in Southwark and who may have had connections to the Rose Theater and its operations by simply asking, does Reasonable's presence in that location not give him a connection to and have implications for the popular theater industry in the neighborhood? They open up possibilities for developing a very different picture of theater in Shakespeare's time. And who contributed to its creation and to its operation? So once we know something is plausible, shouldn't we ask the questions that may open up the archives even more, as well as creating new spaces for inquiry and in doing so, opening the field to a diversity of scholars and scholarship. So I started this lecture by exposing how decolonizing history angers people on GB News, but also elsewhere. People who may only have a super, su superficial understanding of colonial history tend to lash out at those who are still mired in it every day. So for the last part of this talk, I want to share some thoughts on casting and what happens when we don't commit to untangling theater and performance histories, the history uh, or the history of reception of Shakespeare from a, a, a white racial framework. In some ways, the way we've talked about Shakespeare traditionally in the academy and how we push those conversations out into the public sphere can have extremely high consequences for contemporary theater and the debate about who Shakespeare belongs to. The far-reaching consequences for casting and for the tug of war that characterizes the clash amongst theater critics and audiences should give us pause. Some see casting black actors in Shakespearean roles as woke, when this has been a practice for over 200 years. In her introduction to her collection of essays on colorblind casting in Shakespearean theater, Ayanna Thompson provides a brief history of the practice tracing it to Joseph Papp's New York Shakespeare Festival in the 1950s. On balance, at the time, it was designed to integrate black actors into the performance of Shakespeare's plays, providing hope that an integrationalist ideology would benefit not only the black performance community, but also race relations in American theater. While there had already been a long tradition of black Shakespeare performance, not least the 19th century African theater in New York, founded by James Hewlett, and that produced Ira Allridge, these early renditions were not considered colorblind forms of casting because they were confined to black actors. But since the 1960s, it was deemed that colorblindness as a social value is valuable. It would lead to racial equality. This principle has since been problematized by critical race theory, which argues that colorblindness hides not only racial difference, but also racial inequality. During the summer of 2020, when the Black Lives Matter protests were happening throughout the world, in the UK, the statue of the slaver Edward Colston was toppled and pushed into Bristol Harbor. For many, it symbolized an attack on British history and values, fears about Shakespeare being symbolically pulled down from his plinth have helped to shape arguments against diverse casting practices in general. I'm thinking my US book cover may not help. <laughs> in the last three years, the cultural landscape in which Shakespeare is performed has altered dramatically. And this forces us to examine anew the kinds of strategies theaters and production companies should look to adopt to move away from a practice that, as Omari Newton has described, is a form of erasure or, as he elaborates, quote, that's the theatrical equivalent of telling your black friend I don't see color when they're trying to talk to you about race. Since black and minority ethnic actors have been playing Shakespeare, there's been no dearth in racist responses. But there's something newly troubling and insidious about the kinds of outbursts that have occurred in the last three years. In particular, when theater companies, or television and film companies for that matter, cast with race, racial consciousness, an attempt to address the imbalance in the stories we've told while also addressing the problems of representation more broadly. 
In 2022, when the Globe Theater ad advertised its new production of Julius Caesar with a black woman pictured on the poster, attacks were levied against the theater for being woke. As the production was about to open, an audience member wearing a t-shirt with the phrase, all lives matter, printed boldly, tried to make himself prominent in the auditorium where actor and audience are equally lit. Moreover, the Globe continued to be bombarded via email and social media with racist uh, threats for several days afterwards. And it's hard to imagine the impact of that on the actors themselves. In another example, early in 2022, the Royal Shakespeare Company advertised a spectacular new production of Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. The play, directed by Roy Alexander Wise, could be staged in an, would be staged in an Afrofuturistic setting, an artistic movement that explores black history and culture through science fiction. The posters showcase the beauty of blackness as well as the costumes, with actors Michael Balogun and Akia Henry in the lead roles of Benedict and Beatrice. The acting artistic director Erica Wyman was horrified by the outcry from some members of the general public who were extremely racist on their social media channels. In a targeted response, she observed in an interview with the BBC that the disgraceful reaction only arose from a minority of people. Perhaps it is a minority, but they are loud. It does make you wonder who is not saying what they think each time they see one of these casting decisions made in a play that once spoke to them through the universalist prism of Shakespeare's genius. The insertion of actors of color into Shakespeare productions was not well received in the early 20th century when it began in America, but an integrationalist ideology enabled colorblind casting to flourish, becoming the fairest way to cast Shakespeare in both senses of the word. But I think this is where the problem lies. The insertion of black characters, black histories, and culture into Shakespeare's texts disrupts this universalist paradigm and interferes with the very notion that Shakespeare is, in Arthur Little's words, white property, making it fodder for the culture war. It then disenfranchises theater, its increasingly diverse community of actors, makers, and audiences, and fundamentally, it endangers Shakespeare himself. Colorblind casting seems equivalent to colorblind theater historiography or dramatic criticism in some ways. It's as if uh, you say, I see black people in early modern plays, but I don't have to account for them or think about why they are there. When a study comes along that suggests there is a reason they are there, and that has something to do with who we are today, how will we respond? <laughs> Thank you. This is the moment where we can collectively thank Farah um, for taking us through this discussion. Um, and then we head outside. So thank you. second year English students here and we decided to come to this talk because we're currently studying Shakespeare mm. and it was just a great opportunity to hear about an aspect that's not necessarily covered frequently in the kind of mainstream mm -hmm. teaching yeah um, and it was really refreshing and insightful to be actu to actually hear someone kind of validate the silences that come with studying such a canonistic author yeah, yeah. and it was just really yeah it was really refreshing yeah, um, we particularly appreciated how race was at the centre of this conversation mm. rather than something that's 
tiptoed around or marginalised. Yeah. Um, so I think this event was a really good reminder of the fact that we can't hide in objectivity anymore when we think about theatre history. Uh, and what Farah's work does so brilliantly is stitches uh, the really urgent questions that we're facing today onto a past uh, in which they were no less apparent and present. The lecture was brilliant. Farah has such an incredible way of explaining these really um, big concepts in such an accessible um, and easygoing and, and sometimes even you know funny kind of manner. Um, no, I, I really I love all of her work, and this this lecture was no exception. I mean, it was brilliant. Um, so we really wanted to go to this talk because it's not really an area that is prominent academic discourse and I think it's a really important question um, in terms of like raising questions about like colorblind casting and like the need to have actors especially actors of color to kind of embrace their own identities within the stage um, especially because it's kind of a white dominated industry um, so that was really interesting for me. Yeah, I think I just stumbled across the event online and I'm so glad that I did. It was so interesting to hear about how gesture and language interact with race and it's definitely raised some really interesting questions which I'll be thinking about for a long time. So thoroughly enjoyed today's talk um, and as an Oxford resident, really appreciate um, the work done by Torch in opening up these education experiences to um, the wider community in Oxford. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much to the organisers. It was thought-provoking and educational. Thank you. I really wanted to come to the lecture today to support a woman of colour, a scholar of colour, um, who has led the way in race studies and Shakespearean studies and has um, really uh, blazed a path for people like me. I'm a PhD student at the Shakespeare Institute, um, so this was an opportunity to learn more and celebrate the work of Shakespeare and also Farah. Thank you.